Hey everyone, and welcome back to another video, especially all you homework club kids. Now, what are we talking about today? Today we are talking about reading some books. Actually, we'll be reading two whole books. Well, not whole books. We'll be reading part of our chapter book. But if you guys follow along with the videos we've been making, it's pretty much like reading the whole book. So, before we jump into our awesome stories today, let's talk about our riddle. So, our riddle today is, who can shave 25 times but still have a beard? I don't know. It's a bit of a stumper. Good luck, guys, and we will talk about it at the end of the video. Today, we are going to read the story of Big Al. Now, who is Big Al, you might be asking? He's only the kindest, nicest fish in the sea. But just because he looks different than the other fish, they don't want to be friends with him. They don't want to hang out. That makes my little heart sad. So, let's read more about it. Let's see if anything changes. And maybe there's a lesson we can learn from this story. So, keep those ears open. We're about to read our story. In the wide blue sea, there was a very friendly fish named Big Al. You could not find a nicer fish. But... Big Al was also very, very scary. Other fish seemed to have at least one friend. Some had many, but Big Al had none. He did not really blame the other fish. How could he expect the little fish to trust a great big fish with eyes and skin and teeth like his? So Big Al was lonely and cried big salty tears into the big salty sea. Oh, that makes my heart even sadder. But Big Al really wanted friends, so he worked at it. First, he tried wrapping himself up with seaweed. He thought it was a great disguise, but no one else did. Who wants to stop and talk to a floating plant that has big, sharp teeth? Then he thought if he puffed himself up round, the other fish would laugh and see how clever and silly he could be. All they saw was how big he could be and they steered clear. He does look funny though, like a big puffer fish. Very early one morning, Big Al went down to the bottom and flopped and wiggled himself into the sand until he was almost covered up. He looked much smaller. When the other fish came near, Big Al talked and joked with them and had a delightful time. But then one scratchy little grain of sand got stuck in his gills. And he, and he, and he sneezed. When the cloud of sand cleared away, all the other fish were gone. Big Al even changed his color one day so that he could look like he belonged to a school of tiny fish passing by. He bubbled along with them for a while, laughing and feeling like he was just one of the crowd. But he was so big and clumsy that when the tiny fish started to dart to the left and then quickly back to the right, Big Al just plowed straight ahead. He even went bumping and thumping right into the little fish. Before he could even say, excuse me, they were gone and he was all alone, sadder than ever. Just when Big Al was starting to be sure that he would never have a single friend, something happened. He was floating along, sadly, watching some of the smaller fish and wishing that they would come closer. As he watched, a net dropped down silently from above. And in an instant, they were caught. Oh no, look at all those fish he's caught. Big Al forgot all about being lonely and he forgot about being sad. His eyes bulged out bigger and rounder than ever. And that mighty flip of a tail, he opened his mouth and charged straight at the net. The net was strong, but Big Al was stronger. He ripped right through it and all the little fish rushed out through the hole. What a hero. But when Big Al tried to turn around and go out the hole, he got tangled up in the net. 
He was stuck! The net went higher and higher towards the bright surface of the sea, and the little fish watched as Big Al disappeared above them. When the little fish were able to speak again, all they talked about was the huge, wonderful fish that saved them. How great to be free, but what a shame that the big fellow had been captured. Just then, there was a tremendous crashing splash above them, and the small fish dashed away. Was it the net again? Not at all. It was Big Al. Those fishermen took one look at him and threw him right back into the ocean. And now there is one huge, puffy, scary, fierce looking fish in the sea who has more friends than anyone else. Big Al. And that's it. That is our story. That is the story of Big Al. Being different isn't always a bad thing. We have different strengths than other people. And Big Al's was being a hero and being actually quite strong to break that net, right? So now that we've read our story, we've got positive action to do. Today, our positive action is all about being persistent. So what does that even mean? Let's talk about it. Being persistent means that you don't give up, that no matter what happens, no matter what life throws at you, you don't let it defeat you. You rise to the challenge and you keep on going. Now there's a lot of ways we can be persistent, right? We can be persistent with friends. We wanna make someone our friend, so we just keep talking to them. <laughs> we can be persistent with our schoolwork. I know when I was younger, I had a lot of trouble with my math work, right? And a lot of times I didn't wanna do it. It scared me, it freaked me out, I didn't understand it, but through persistence, persisting, I got it done, I learned, I grew, and I became more confident in my skills. And when we talk about our self-awareness, our self-concept, empathy, respect, all these things, they're not gonna be things we just get, that we just understand, right? We've talked about this before. It's something you've gotta work for. You've gotta be persistent and keep trying because you're not gonna get it in one day. You're not gonna wake up tomorrow and be like, oh, I am the queen of empathy. I know how to do all things. I am the most empathetic person ever. No, <laughs> sadly, that's not real. That's not real life. We have to be persistent. We have to keep working. We have to keep growing and evolving. And through persistence, through trying and raising the bar for ourselves and continuing to rise to the challenge, we grow and we become our best selves. We begin to realize our potential, right? What we can be, what we could do if we just keep going. So I hope you've learned a little bit more about persistence and I hope you give it a try because guess what? Once you keep going, once you let yourself feel this pride, let yourself feel this motivated, there's nothing you can't do. Go and be persistent. So, now that we've talked about our positive action, I do believe we have a book to read. <laughs> I hope you guys are super ready because it is time to get into our super cool book, James and the Giant Peach. I'm excited because these guys have tethered a bunch, a bunch, I believe 502 seagulls to fly their giant peach up out of the water to, I don't know, the ship they passed was heading towards America. Are they heading towards America? To be determined. Let's jump back in and see what happens. Part 24. Up on the peach itself, everyone was still happy and excited. I wonder where we'll finish this time, the earthworm said. Who cares, they answered. Seagulls always go back to the land sooner or later. Up and up they went, high above the clouds. The peach was swaying gently from side to side as it floated. Wouldn't this be the perfect time for a little music, said Miss Ladybird. How about it, old grasshopper? With pleasure, dear lady, the old green grasshopper answered, bowing from the waist. 
Oh, hooray! He's going to play for us, they cried, and immediately the whole company sat themselves down in a circle around the old green musician, and the concert began. From the moment that the first note was struck, the audience became completely spellbound, and as for James, never had he heard such a beautiful sound. In the garden at home on summer evenings, he had listened many times to the sound of grasshoppers chirping in the grass, but he had always liked the noise they made. But this was a different kind of noise altogether. This was real music, chords, harmonies, tunes, and all the rest of it. And what a wonderful instrument the grasshopper was playing upon. It was like a violin. It was almost exactly as though he were playing upon a violin. The bow of the violin, the part that moved, was his back leg, and the strings of the violin, the part of, that made the sound, was the edge of his wing. He was using only the top in his back legs, well, his thigh, and he was stroking up and down against the edge of his wing with incredible skill, sometimes slowly, sometimes fast, but always with the same easy flowing action. It was precisely the way a clever violinist would have used his bow. And the music came pouring out and filled the whole blue sky around them with magic melodies. When the first part was finished, everyone clapped madly, and Miss Spider stood up and shouted, Bravo, bravo, encore, give us some more. Did you like that, James? asked the grasshopper as he smiled at the small boy. Oh, I loved it, James answered. It was beautiful. It was as though you were playing a real violin. A real violin? The old green grasshopper cried, good heavens, I like that, my dear boy. I am a real violin. It is part of my own body. But do all grasshoppers play music on violins the same way you do? No, he answered, not at all. If you want to know, I happen to be short-horned grasshopper. I have two short feelers coming out of my head. Can you see them? There they are. They're quite short, aren't they? That's why they call me short horn. And we have short horns. We are the only ones who play our music in the violin style using a bow. My long horned relatives, the ones who have long curvy feelers coming out of their heads, make their music simply by rubbing the edges of their two top wings together. They are not violinists. They are wing rubbers. And a rather inferior noise these ring rubbers produce too. If I may say so, it sounds more like a banjo than a fiddle. How fascinating this is, cried James, and to think that up until now, I had never even wondered how a grasshopper made his sounds. My dear young fellow, the grasshopper said gently, there are a whole lot of things in the world of ours that you haven't even started wondering about yet. Where, for example, do I keep my ears? Your ears? Why, your head, of course. Everyone burst out laughing. You mean, you don't know that, cried the centipede. Try again said the old green grasshopper, smiling at James. You can't possibly keep them anywhere else. Oh, can't I? Well, I give up. Where do you keep them? Right here, the old green grasshopper said. One on each side of my tummy. That's not true. Of course it's true. What's so peculiar about that? You ought to see where my cousins, the crickets and the catchedids keep theirs. Where do they keep them? On their legs, one in the front and one just below the knee. You mean you didn't know that either? Said the centipede scornfully. You're joking, James said. Nobody could possibly have ears on their legs. Why not? Because, because it's ridiculous, that's why. You know, what I think is ridiculous? Said the centipede, grinning away as usual. I don't mean to be rude, but I think it's ridiculous to have ears on the same sides of your head. It certainly looks ridiculous. You ought to take a peek in the mirror one day and see for yourself. Pest, cried the earthworm. Why, you must always be so rude and rambunctious to everyone. You ought to apologize to James at once. Part 25. James didn't want the earthworm and the centipede to get into another argument. So he quickly said to the earthworm, Tell me, do you play any kind of music? No, but I do other things, some of which are really quite extraordinary, the earthworm said. Such as what? James asked. Well, the earthworm said, next time you stand in a field or garden and look around you, then remember this. 
that every grain of soil upon the surface of the land, every tiny bit of soil that you can see, has actually passed through the body of an earthworm during the last few years. Isn't that wonderful? It's not possible, said James. My dear boy, it's fact. You mean like you actually swallow the soil? Like mad, the earthworm said proudly. In one end and out the other. <laughs> How silly. But what's the point? What do you mean, what's the point? Why do you do it? We do it for the farmers. It makes the soil nice and light and crumbly, so they have something that will grow well in it. If you really want to know, the farmers couldn't do it without us. We are essential. We are vital. So it's only natural that the farmer should love us. He loves us even more, I believe, than he loves the ladybird. The ladybird, said James? Do they love you too? I'm told that they do said the ladybird, answering modestly as she blushed. In fact, I understand that in some places, farmers love us so much, they go out and buy live ladybirds by the shackles and take them home and set them free in the fields. They are very pleased when they have lots of ladybirds on their land. Well, why? Because we gobble up the nasty little insects that are gobbling up all the farmers' crops. It helps enormously. And we ourselves don't charge a penny for the services. I think you're wonderful, James told her. Can I ask you one special question? Please do. Well, it's really true that I can tell how old you are as a ladybird with the spots on your back. Oh no, that's just a children's story, said the ladybird. We never change our spots. Some of us, of course, are born with more spots than others, but we never change them. The number of spots that a ladybird has is simply a way of showing which branch of the family she belongs to. I, for example, as you can see, have nine, am a nine spotted ladybird. I am very lucky. It's a fine thing to be. It is indeed, said James, gazing at the beautiful scarlet shell with nine black spots on it. On the other hand, the ladybird went on, some of my less fortunate relatives have no more than one or two spots altogether on their shells. Can you imagine that? They're called two-spotted ladybirds, and very common and ill-mannered they are, I regret to say. And then, of course, we have your five-spotted, two-spotted ones, although I myself find them a trifle too saucy for my taste. But they are all loved, all of them, asked James. Yes. The ladybird answered quickly, they are all loved. It seems that most everyone around here is loved, said James. How nice it is. Not me, cried the centipede. I am a pest and I'm proud of it. Oh, I am shockingly dreadful pest. Oh, goodness, centipede. He's something else. We'll stop right there. So make sure you tune in next time to see what we get up to in our book. Now let's go figure out our riddle. So, if you guys remember, at the beginning of our video, we had our riddle. Who can shave 25 times a day and still have a beard? Whew, did you figure it out? Like I said, I thought it was some magic, but I'm ready to tell you the answer. Do you know it? Are you ready? The answer is a barber. Get it? He can shave everybody else's face, but his can still have a beard. <laughs> I thought that was fun and a little bit tricky. So I hope you guys enjoyed it and I'll see you tomorrow. Bye. Thank you for watching.